Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, yet again to another Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Uh, we're delighted to have you all accompany us today. Uh, we've got a great presentation. I want to remind you, as always, uh, we have a chat box uh, to the right of your screen. I uh, encourage you to uh, pose your questions at, a, at the end of our Q&A, but just be thinking of, uh, of questions uh, for Dr. Uh, Cheatham uh, uh, at the end of the presentation today. Uh, before we get started, uh, as always also, I'd like to open up in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, are delighted to, to be together corporately, Lord, uh, just through uh, the venue of Samaritan's Purse. And uh, Lord, I just uh, thank you for uh, Dr. Uh, Cheatham and his willingness uh, to join us today. And uh, just speak through him, Lord, uh, that we may be better educated uh, to serve our patients and to present the gospel around the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, today um, we're going to be talking about burn care with limited resources and delighted to present to you Dr. Uh, Mike Cheatham. Uh, Dr. Cheatham graduated from Stanford University uh, with a BS degree in biology uh, with departmental honors in 1985. Thereafter, he went to medical school at Vanderbilt University uh, and graduated in 19, uh, 1989. Uh, thereafter, he uh, did a residency in general surgery uh, and, um, and then a two-year uh, fellowship uh, in surgical critical care, uh, also at Vanderbilt, and completed that in 96. Um, Dr. Cheatham now serves as the chair of the Orlando Health uh, Physicians uh, Surgical Group, uh, the chief surgical quality officer for Orlando Regional, uh, and the academic chair of the Department of Surgical Education. He is also uh, actively practicing acute care, uh, trauma and burn uh, surgery at uh, the level one trauma uh, center at Orlando Regional Medical Center. Um, and Dr. Cheatham and his fellow trauma surgeons were uh, actively involved uh, in the response uh, to the Orlando Pulse nightclub uh, tragedy that I'm sure you all very poignantly remember that occurred uh, la uh, in June of 2016. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, you know was tragic and one of the worst mass shootings uh, in uh, U.S. history. And Dr. Cheatham spearheaded that response and just did an incredible job. With regard to Samaritan's Purse, um, he's been very involved. Specifically over the last 30 years, uh, uh, Dr. Cheatham has been active in medical missions and international disaster response uh, through uh, both World Medical Mission and Samaritan's Purse, and has worked across uh, the globe in uh, Africa, Asia, and uh, South America. And uh, Dr. Cheatham also serves uh, on the board of directors, both at Samaritan's Purse and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Um, I've had the pleasure of responding on the field with uh, Mike, and he is uh, just an amazing uh, man of God uh, and uh, an amazing surgeon, too. I've learned a, a lot from him, and I'm really delighted to present him today as he presents burn care uh, with limited resources. Mike? Well, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world. This is really, uh, this is really an honor, and and I uh, really thank Lance for this opportunity. Um, what I want to try and get across to everybody uh, today is that burns are not scary. Uh, unfortunately, as we'll talk about, uh, burns are something that uh, many uh, people who uh, work abroad don't have a whole lot of experience with. Yet they're a very common injury, uh, and. Uh, being able to treat uh, burns uh, makes a huge difference uh, for patients. So if I can go ahead and have the first slide, there we go. So, so this, let me start off with a, with a kind of the, the typical uh, burn case uh, that is seen in a mission hospital. Um, this was a, a young man that uh, I took care of when I was at uh, Tenwick a couple of years ago. Uh, classic story uh, of someone with a history of seizures uh, he's asleep in his hut. Uh, there's an open fire uh, in the middle uh, of the hut, and he has a seizure and rolls into the fire. Very common history. Uh, and as you can see, he sustained burns to his chest, his arm, and to his head. The problem was uh, that Tenwick's dermatome had broken, uh, and the, the uh, engineering team there had actually even tried to build uh, uh, the cog inside the, the dermatome that had broken uh, to try and have a working dermatome so that they could treat this young man. Uh, and of course, the minute they turned it on, the cog that they had fabricated unfortunately broke. So he had to wait 45 days until we were able to find a new dermatome uh, 
uh, and I was able to, to bring it in with me uh, to the country. The problem is he sat there for 45 days, during which time uh, he's developing contractures, uh, his wounds are getting infected, uh, and he's taking up a very valuable bed uh, in a mission hospital. Uh, so literally, uh, I arrived, uh, we sterilized the dermatome, uh, and he had skin grafts uh, on him uh, literally that afternoon, uh, as you can see. If I can have the next slide, please. So the problem is that burns are very common uh, in the developing world. They're a very common method of injury, uh, but frequently their presentation is delayed. Um, you know, here in the States, uh, when I get a burn patient uh, into our uh, trauma center, they'll usually arrive within a couple of hours of injury. In the developing world, patients may wait sometimes several weeks uh, before they uh, come to the hospital simply because uh, they're not used to traveling long distances or, or they think it is going to heal up on their own or perhaps they're, they're using local tribal medicine. Burn care is something that requires a lot of resources. Uh, it requires operative time, uh, frequently multiple operative procedures. It requires equipment that a lot of mission hospitals don't have. Uh, it requires a tremendous amount of uh, disposable supplies, dressing supplies. Uh, and most importantly, it takes up a lot of hospital days. So in Africa, uh, if we look at uh, per percent total body surface area burned, uh, in Africa, most hospital length of stay for pay burned patients is about two to four days. And in the U.S., it's about one day. So patients on the mission field are going to stay in the hospital a lot longer uh, than they would in the States. And part of that is simply because uh, most mission hospitals don't have the uh, staff that is necessary, or they don't have surgeons that have the time to be able to do some of these long cases. And so uh, certainly my experience uh, on the mission field at, at several different hospitals has been that the burns typically get put to the back of the list. Uh, what I'd like to get across to you all today is that by uh, kind of attacking those burns early on uh, when it's appropriate, you can actually uh, really help these patients uh, both long term as well as help reduce uh, the uh, expenditure and the cost to the hospital. The burns don't have to be scary. Um, but they tend to result in patients kind of just tending to get stuck off in the back corner of a ward and just waiting uh, unnecessarily. If we could have the next slide. So we know that if we take a patient who has been burned uh, and we uh, kind of attack that early and we provide the, the care that is necessary, and it doesn't have to be fancy care, it doesn't have to be expensive care, but just uh, trying to intervene on burns early, that's going to improve the patient's long-term outcome. It's going to reduce their pain. Uh, it's going to decrease their hospital length of stay. It's going to decrease the cost because the longer you wait, the harder it is to get these patients uh, uh, rehabilitated and back to a normal lifestyle. It's going to avoid contracture formation uh, and the need for subsequent reconstructive surgery, which is then going to be dependent upon having a usually a hand surgeon specialist or someone like that come out onto the field and be able to repair what probably could have been prevented early on. And most importantly, it's going to reduce the lifelong disability for that patient, return them to be a functional member uh, of their family and of society, and uh, relieve the family from having to care for them, which then would take a second person out of the ability uh, to be able to work on the family farm or in the family's business. Next slide. So there are a couple of things that uh, if you're going to go out onto the mission field, uh, it, it would be a good idea to gain some skills with. Uh, first off, just basic things like learning the types of burn wounds uh, and their treatment. We'll talk about that today. Uh, learn how to do a burn wound dressing change. Also very, very simple but uh, something that many physicians and nurses may not be uh, familiar with. Uh, then if, you, if you're going to be operating, you'd want to become familiar in how to do some simple burn wound debridements. Very, very easy to do. Uh, and I'll talk about some of the equipment that you can use to accomplish that. And then how to do some simple split thickness skin grafts, which can make a huge difference for patients and help avoid contracture formation. Next slide. Let's just talk a little bit about the, the impact of burns. So 90% uh, of the burns uh, occur in the developing world. If you look uh, at the statistics, 
almost nine burns per 100,000 people uh, per year in Africa, uh, whereas it's less than one burn per 100,000 uh, per year in the US. Uh, so that's a 12-fold difference. Uh, children, very common uh, to have burn injuries. Uh, the pattern is a little bit different by age. So adult burns are more commonly due to open flames, uh, whereas pediatric burns more commonly scald injuries uh, due to pulling a pot of hot water, uh, for example, off the fire or off of a stove onto them. The nice thing is that scald burns because it's water, uh, the water cools off much more quickly, so the burns tend to not be as deep. Uh, unless the water has a lot of grease in it, grease tends to hold on to heat. And so those burns, uh, because the grease kind of doesn't run off the skin as quickly as water would, the heat is kept on the skin for a longer period of time. And so grease burns tend to be uh, associated with deeper burns. So adults are more likely to sustain deeper burns, either due to grease, uh, oil, uh, flame, than our children, which uh, is, is a blessing. Next slide. Mortality, is, again, huge disparity between what we see uh, in the developing world versus uh, in, for example, the United States. So uh, here in the US, it's not uncommon uh, for patients with over 90% of their body uh, burned to survive. Uh, in the developing world, very different scenario. There, because of the limited resources, uh, mortality is almost 100%. Uh, in most hospitals for burns exceeding 40% uh, total body surface area. I admit patients with 40% of their body burned on a regular basis, and most of those patients will survive unless they have additional comorbidities. Again, not the case uh, abroad. And then female burns, uh, female burn mortality uh, is much higher than that of males. And this is literally the one traumatic injury where the a gender ratio is flipped in favor of, of women having a higher mortality. Why? They're much more commonly around open flames, open, uh, around cooking fires, uh, cooking with boiling water, uh, things along those, uh, those lines. Next slide. Disability really becomes, uh, as we've uh, talked about a little bit, the, the, the factor that you want to try and, and prevent. Not only do burns have a tremendous impact on patients, both physically and emotionally, but it, uh, the, the disfigurement that can result leads to significant uh, social rejection. Uh, they may be ostracized, uh, their family uh, may be ostracized from, from the village, uh, and they are now no longer able to either help with the family to uh, maintain a living, or they're not able to help around the home. And then in severe burns, as I mentioned earlier, now you have to have other family members who are, are now having to care for the patient. So here are two uh, examples of significant burn contractures that we saw in Africa a couple of years back uh, that are gonna require uh, significant uh, releases, uh, contracture releases to try and restore that extremity to functionality. And so anything we can do early on to help prevent that from occurring would be beneficial. Next slide. Uh, so common mechanisms, as we mentioned, open uh, cooking fires, uh, boiling water, seizures, as we saw in the, the case uh, that we started off with, kerosene stoves and lamps, uh, candles that are being used for light, uh, the fact that many of the clothing that uh, women especially wear with uh, large skirts uh, easily uh, catching on fire and leading to significant lower extremity burns. And then, uh, especially over in the, the uh, western part of uh, Africa, uh, where there's a lot uh, more uh, oil drilling uh, and the like, you tend to see uh, either gasoline or oil tanker explosions, uh, which uh, have caused literally hundreds of burn patients to uh, descend on, uh, on mission hospitals uh, in years past. Next slide. So uh, many of you are gonna be familiar with the traditional nomenclature of first degree, second degree, and third degree burns. Uh, those have largely been replaced by uh, the definitions of uh, either superficial partial thickness or deep partial thickness burns. Uh, and the best way to think of that is that a partial thickness burn is going to heal spontaneously over time. And then what used to be called third degree would be full thickness. So with a full thickness burn, all the layers of the skin 
uh, have been burned away. There's no epithelium to grow back, and those burns are going to require uh, surgical intervention. And then what used to be called a fourth degree burn, uh, this is where it gets down into the muscle and the tendon. Again, those are going to require a surgical uh, intervention. Next slide. So here's some, some examples from Tenwick. Um, these are examples of partial thickness burns. So a superficial uh, partial thickness burn is typically pink. Uh, it's moist. It will blanch to uh, pressure. Uh, it tends to be extremely painful. So if you have a patient that comes in with a burn and they are complaining of pain when you touch it, that's great. That is good news because that tells you that the nerve endings have not been burned away and that burn probably is going to be able to heal uh, on its own. It's when they don't complain of pain that we get worried because that's more common uh, with a full thickness burn. Superficial partial thickness burns should heal up within about 14 days or so, seven to 14 days, depending on how deep it is. And they just need local wound care. And it's very simple uh, wound care and keeping the wound clean, nothing fancy. Uh, deep partial thickness burns, uh, there's still epithelium present. They're going to take longer to heal. Uh, you'll have maybe some reduced sensation, uh, but there's still some pain. Uh, they're less likely to blanch. Uh, this is this is kind of the conundrum in, in burn surgery because you don't know what direction it's, it's going to go. Uh, it'll either start to heal up on its own if you're able to provide the patient with good wound care and good nutrition, or it may actually convert to become a full thickness burn, and now you're going to have to think about skin grafting it. If it is a, a deep partial thickness burn that's over a joint or over, uh, for example, say a hand, which is very important to our being able to be functional, those we would probably go ahead and skin graft, uh, even though they're maybe not a full thickness burn, simply because the contractures that will develop, uh, if you allow it to heal in on its own over a period of weeks to months, will probably lead to a, a hand that's not going to work. Next slide. So full thickness burns, pretty straightforward. Um, you, can, you can tell the difference in these two extremities. Uh, the, the skin tends to be white or especially yellow. It tends to be waxy and leathery. Uh, it has a very dull uh, appearance to it if you shine light on it. Uh, it tends to be insensate. Uh, you can sometimes see uh, the veins thrombosed underneath the skin. Uh, muscle or bone may be exposed. And these you're just going to have to cut away the, the devitalized dead skin uh, and put a skin graft on. And sometimes it will require uh, an amputation uh, if the burn is particularly uh, severe. That hand that you can see in the lower picture, again, this was a young lady that we had at Tenwick who had a seizure and rolled into a fire, and we ended up having to amputate uh, her uh, hand because it was just uh, unsalvageable. Next slide. So just a couple of special considerations and things to look out for. Uh, so hand burns, burns across joints, as I mentioned, you want to have a low threshold for skin grafting those uh, if they are a, a kind of a very deep partial thickness or definitely full thickness burn, because that will help to avoid a long-term disability. Next slide. Uh, inhalation injury, uh, one of those things you have to watch for. So this can either be due to inhalation of uh, the actual flame uh, or perhaps uh, gases that have ignited, or it could just be due to uh, the heat and the soot uh, that one uh, inhales if one's in an enclosed space. So you want to watch for things like facial edema, uh, carbonaceous sputum, uh, soot in their, in their mouth or nose, singed uh, nasal or uh, facial hairs that give you a sense that there was heat or flame near their face. Inhalation injuries significantly increase uh, the patient's uh, mortality. It's going to increase the length of stay. Many of these patients, if they're going to survive, are going to require mechanical ventilation, which may not even be available in the hospital where you're working. Uh, and so inhalation injury has a tremendous impact on uh, patient outcome. Next slide. Quick word about chemical burns, not something that you see typically uh, in Africa or Asia, but it can be in a more urban setting. Uh, the best way to treat a chemical burn is lots of water. Uh, just continue to irrigate the burned tissue, uh, wash the 
patient off liberally, and you need to probably do that for uh, almost an hour to really make sure that you have neutralized and removed any of the chemical that's present. And while doing that, you need to protect yourself uh, because you don't want to get any of that chemical on you. If it's a dry powder and you now put water on it, uh, that it's fine to do that for the patient, but there's now a wet chemical that is uh, you're being exposed to. So you want to protect yourself, make sure that you're covered. After you wash all the chemical off, if that's been neutralized, uh, then you just treat it as you would a thermal burn, as either a partial thickness burn or a full thickness burn. Next slide. Uh, eye burns. Uh, so if we have a patient that we think may have had a, a burn to their eye, the first thing that we would do is uh, use an ultraviolet lamp, what we call a Woods lamp, uh, after putting some fluorescein in their eye. Uh, outside of a few mission hospitals that have eye clinics, you're probably not going to have access to that uh, type of equipment. Patients may complain of pain, they may complain of blurred vision. Uh, so if it's a chemical uh, burn, wash the eye out copiously with water. If you think that there could be soot in the eye, again, wash that out copiously with water. And in the absence of being able to, to more thoroughly evaluate the eye, I would just have a low threshold for putting patients uh, on antibiotic eye drops for a couple of days. Uh, and eye burns typically uh, heal very well unless it's a, a very deep corneal injury. If you have ophthalmology available at the hospital, I would definitely get them involved, uh, but you're gonna be limited at what you can do with an eye burn. Next slide. Electrical burns. So again, not something that you're gonna see a whole lot of uh, in Africa, but certainly in more of the urban settings you might. Uh, electrical burns tend to be very deep. They tend to be third, well, full thickness, what used to be called third degree, or more commonly fourth degree, Evidence of outside injury can be pretty minimal. It may just be some very small uh, open wounds uh, you know, that can be less than five millimeters uh, in diameter, but you'll see kind of a charred edge where the electricity either entered or exited the body. What you wanna be watching for is signs of myoglobinuria, that is muscle breakdown uh, that is then being absorbed into the bloodstream and going to the kidneys. Uh, the classic finding is, is what's known as either tea colored or coke colored uh, urine, uh, which is where the myoglobin is, is filtering through the kidneys. And so you want to continue to flush the kidneys uh, aggressively uh, to try and prevent renal failure, which would be a, a real problem out on the mission field where you don't have access to dialysis very often. Uh, give the patient lots of crystalloid, try and maintain their urinary output above 100 cc's an hour until the urine uh, clears over the next day or two, and then it should be safe to drop their IV fluid rate. All right, next slide. So let's, let's talk a little bit about assessment. So uh, we're probably all familiar with what we call the rule of nines. Uh, and that's basically uh, for an adult, you have 9% of your body surface area is on your arms, 18% on your legs, 18% on the front of the trunk, 18% on the back of the trunk, nine on the head, and 1% for the genitalia. Pretty easy to remember. Uh, honestly, uh, and it changes for kids because the kids have a relatively larger head in proportion to their body. But the easier way to do this, honestly, look at the patient's hand and their hand, fingers and palm, basically represent 1% of their body surface area. So if I'm assessing a burn uh, and, and their hand is pretty close to, to mine, I'll literally just kind of run my hand over and figure out how many of my handprints would fit. Uh, and that gives me a pretty good estimate of what their total body surface area burn is. Next slide. If you want to get a little bit uh, more specific, there is something called the London Browder chart, uh, which varies by age. Uh, and we, so we use this in our burn unit, and it, it's a pretty easy way of being able to keep track of where the burns are uh, and whether they're partial thickness or full thickness. Next slide. So. When burns first come in, you, you usually don't know exactly how severe they are. Uh, it takes time for the burns to evolve, as we say. Uh, now, full thickness burns are going to be pretty obvious from the get-go. You're going to be able to know uh, when you see the thrombosed veins and that, that yellow waxy appearance that that's a full thickness burn. But the partial thickness burns will do uh, one of a couple things. They will either start showing signs of healing in the first day or two, uh, 
uh, and you'll feel comfortable that they are going to remain partial thickness. Or they may look partial thickness to begin with, and then uh, after a couple of days, you may realize they're not showing signs of healing, and they're actually converting, as we say, to full thickness. It takes about three to five days to know exactly what you're up against. You want to make sure during that time that you're resuscitating patients, uh, making sure they're not getting hypotensive uh, so that there isn't a secondary injury, that is conversion of a burn that could have been avoided. We only use antibiotics if there is a sign of active infection, a fever, cellulitis. Uh, there's no, no uh, indication to put people prophylactically on antibiotics. Uh, the antibiotic ointments that we use will, will cover that. And then again, early range of motion. Uh, it's kind of, you know, the old use it uh, or lose it adage. You want to get people moving early uh, so that they're not losing their range of motion long term. Next slide. Tetanus prophylaxis, always important to remember, um, especially uh, given that many of these uh, burns occur uh, out in uh, farm areas, uh, areas uh, that are around uh, stool from animals and the like, not a clean environment. Uh, you want to keep the patient warm because patients cool off very quickly, especially if they have a large open uh, uh, moist wound surface. Providing pain control is important using a combination of narcotics, uh, nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory medications, and ketamine. The nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory medications help tremendously, especially with both the ability to move and avoiding uh, what we call heterotopic ossification, or that is the deposition of bone into a healing wound that can interfere with mobility long term. Uh, you want to resuscitate patients either orally or IV or both. Uh, the easiest way to know how much fluid to give is by using the Parkland formula, uh, but just making sure the patient has adequate urinary output is, is probably just as good. Uh, you want to maintain urinary output at at least half a cc per kilogram per hour. Uh, and watch them for the development of compartment syndrome. Next slide. So let's just talk uh, through an example of the Parkland formula because this is uh, frequently a source of confusion. So the Parkland formula only gets calculated for uh, the presence of uh, second and third degree burns. That is uh, partial thickness, deep partial thickness, or full thickness burns. If the skin is not blistered, it does not get included in the Parkland formula. So it's common for me to get a phone call uh, that a patient has, say, 60% total body surface area burns. And my first question is always, what percent is blistered? At which point I'll usually be told, oh, well, maybe only 5%. Well, then the patient really only has a 5% burn. So just red in skin, uh, not anything to worry about. So here's an example of a 26-year-old uh, female. This is the young girl in Kenya who rolled into a fire after a seizure. She came in with 20% of her body, uh, had second and third degree burns. This occurred four hours prior to presentation. So we went ahead and used the rule of nines. We figured out that she had about 6% of her head and face was burned, 6% of her chest, and 8% of her uh, left hand and arm. So that gives us a total of 20%. So four milliliters uh, times her weight of 50. Uh, times the 20% total body surface area gets us 4,000 milliliters. What we want to do is give half of that volume uh, in the first eight hours post burn injury. And since she didn't present to us for four hours, that means we have four hours to get two liters into her. So her IV fluid rate would be 500 cc's an hour for the first four hours. And then we give the other half, the other 2,000 milliliters over the following 16 hours. Next slide. Uh, watch the extremities, uh, and uh, if the patient uh, appears to be having decreased perfusion, especially if they have full thickness burns, you may need to do what we call escarotomies. And this is basically cutting through the burned tissue into the subcutaneous tissue to relieve uh, the compression. When, when you have a full thickness burn, the skin contracts, and it's almost uh, like uh, taking an ACE wrap and wrapping it very, very tightly around somebody's arm or leg. And you can imagine you lose the pulse. So what you want to do is cut through this, the burned skin uh, and allow the, the skin to uh, open up so that you can restore blood flow uh, to the extremity. And the best way to do this, uh, you can see in the illustration, 
the lines that are typically followed for escharotomies, uh, and then check the pulses distally. You may need to use a, a Doppler to be able to do that, but make sure that you've restored uh, blood flow to the extremity. Next slide. Uh, you'll see patients come in with all kinds of different things that have been placed on their burn uh, while in the village. Uh, flour, uh, egg is a very common one, uh, ashes, uh, or even animal dung. Uh, you want to wash all of that off. It uh, interferes with your ability to assess the burn, can lead to infection, uh, and uh, is not going to help this patient heal. Next slide. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, about treatment. So uh, blisters, if you have blisters and they're larger than two centimeters, uh, we wanna just go ahead and open those up. Smaller blisters uh, may even reabsorb on their own, uh, really nothing to worry about, but if they're larger, get all of that dead skin off of there, it's dead, the patient is not going to, uh, uh, they're not gonna benefit from it being there uh, and it just interferes with wound care. Uh, every day, as you do dressing changes on these patients, you want to remove the collagen that the body uh, creates. It's sort of like when we were all kids and you, you tripped, you fell, you skinned your knee, and your body formed a scab uh, over that open wound. That yellow material, that it's a high-protein fluid, uh, is collagen. And we want to get that off every day because that can get infected and it can keep burn wounds from healing. So typically, soap water, washcloths, maybe even tongue depressors to help scrape that off, it's uncomfortable. You don't wish burns on, on anybody. Uh, and so you're going to need to give these patients good pain control and maybe even take them to the operating theater. Uh, you wanna keep the burn wounds moist so that they will heal properly. Uh, you wanna make sure that patients are moving their extremities with good range of motion uh, and use splints on the hands uh, in a position of function to keep them from forming contractures. Next slide. Here's a, a young girl that we had a couple of years ago in Togo uh, who had uh, very significant burns after pulling a, bot, a pot of, of boiling water on top of her. In the left picture, you can see that she's had some skin grafts. Uh, she's got some donor sites up there on her upper back. Uh, she's got some open wounds that are granulating down on her lower legs. Uh, and we basically took her to theater each day to give her ketamine so that she could tolerate uh, the dressing change. You'll note she has a urinary catheter in place so that she's not urinating on her grafts. Uh, and obviously when she stools, that uh, had to be cleaned quickly uh, to avoid infection. Uh, but every day we could see her showing signs of improvement with that aggressive therapy. Next slide. What to put on burns? Uh, you know, it, it's uh, always a source of, of debate, and it's more a question of what you have access to. Um, silvadine used to be uh, very commonly used. Uh, there's now some literature to suggest that it probably may not be as effective as we might have originally thought. So we typically use triple antibiotic ointment. Uh, the dollar store is your best friend. Uh, when it comes to uh, getting burn supplies. And you can usually get some pretty large tubes uh, very inexpensively of, of the triple antibiotic ointment. Um, our our uh, burn ARNP here uh, at our burn center uh, makes almost a, a weekly trip to the dollar store to clean them out. And then she takes that with her uh, to Africa to use. So triple anti antibiotic ointment is, your, is probably your best ointment to put on a burn injury. Uh, gentian violet, uh, kind of an old time uh, solution, but still used in some burn centers. Uh, honey, uh, if you have access to it, works uh, very well, helps to reduce infection. Uh, if you have access to fresh papaya, you can actually mash that up and put that on a burn wound, and it will actually, uh, the, the uh, enzymes in uh, the uh, fruit will help to remove some of that uh, slough and some of the collagen that forms. Uh, so if you have access to papaya, that can be useful. If you have burns that look like they're infected, uh, then using uh, dilute vinegar or bleach solutions can help to treat the infection, uh, get rid of the infection so that you can then think about skin grafting. You don't want to skin graft a wound that is actively infected because your skin graft is, is gonna get chewed up by the bacteria. Uh, so you've got several different options uh, depending on what your resources are. Next slide. 
So let's talk a little bit about full thickness burns. So full thickness burns initially get treated the exact same way as a partial thickness burn. Washing the burn daily, good pain control, keeping the burn moist uh, with a, a, the triple antibiotic ointment, gauze on top of that, good range of motion. The difference here is that you want to get that patient to the operating room earlier rather than later uh, to go ahead and have the full thickness burn removed debrided or excised and have a skin graft put on. That will give you your best long-term function. Next slide. Uh, nutrition. Uh, we can tell who, heal, who, who heals their burn wounds and who doesn't uh, by whether they're eating enough. Uh, when you are burned, you require about twice the normal caloric and, and protein intake. Uh, so about 40 kilocalories per kilogram per day of carbohydrates and fat, about 2 grams per kilogram per day of protein. Uh, you need to figure out what your uh, local resources are. Uh, so you probably won't have uh, access uh, to uh, fancy uh, tube feedings and the like, uh, but certainly having access to beans, uh, eggs, milk, nuts, maybe even some meat uh, can make a huge uh, difference in getting protein into these patients, which is essential for healing. Uh, one of the things that we kind of came up with a couple of years ago uh, when we were in Africa was uh, the idea of creating a tube feeding uh, for these burn uh, victims because they, they typically are unable to eat enough orally to meet their caloric needs, and so you have to supplement them. And if you, if you go into the equipment room of most mission hospitals, you will usually find a box uh, full of uh, these little bags of either F75 or F100, uh, which uh, basically is a powder uh, to uh, create a, a nutritional uh, milk product. If you mix that with whole milk, uh, you can actually recreate uh, one of the most commonly used tube feeds here in the States. Uh, it has about one and a half kilocalories per ml of uh, carbohydrate, and about 62 grams of protein. And it doesn't taste all that bad either. So um, you can make your own uh, high protein, high calorie tube feeding uh, just by using some of your local resources. There are also recipes out there where you can use commercially available milk powder, some oil, some sugar, and some water to do uh, something that is very, very similar. Next slide. Uh, so if, if you're gonna be uh, doing skin grafting, um, I would uh, seriously think about getting what's called a WEC knife. Uh, it also goes by the name of a Goulian knife, but a WEC is the company that, that makes these. They're very, very simple. Uh, you can find them online. If you buy them new, they're a little bit pricey, but you can usually find them used um, uh, online or on eBay. Uh, and this is a tremendous tool. The, there are fancier uh, Debridement knives, but the blades cost about $10 a piece, uh, and uh, they're not readily available. A WEC knife blade uh, you can buy for less than a, a dollar, uh, and not only will a WEC knife allow you to debride a wound and remove the dead tissue, but in a pinch, if you don't have a dermatome, you can use the exact same knife to be able to harvest skin uh, like a dermatome and be able to apply a skin graft. If you have a dermatome, that'd be great. And we'll see a picture in just a moment of a dermatome. Uh, if you have a skin measure, then you're, you're in great shape. A skin measure basically takes a piece of skin, uh, cuts uh, a bunch of tiny little uh, cuts into it, and now turns it into a mesh that can be expanded over a larger area. And so this is how you can take a patient who has a 60 or 70% total body surface area burn uh, and be able to cover them uh, with uh, a much smaller area of skin because you're able to mesh the skin and stretch it out over a, uh, a longer piece uh, of real estate. Uh, if you don't have a skin mesher, you can actually sterilize a small piece of wood, a flat piece of wood, and take a scalpel and just manually cut a bunch of little uh, holes in it and uh, get something very, very similar. Uh, grab Vaseline from the dollar store uh, along with your triple antibiotic ointment uh, because Vaseline is, again, the, it's the mainstay of being able to do burn wound dressings. Uh, and when I ask for Vaseline gauze uh, out on the mission field, I usually am brought a small piece that's maybe about three by four inches. That, it, it just, it doesn't go very far. 
So we learned years ago to just bring large tubs of Vaseline with us. We take regular gauze, which is plentiful at a mission hospital, and we just impregnate the gauze uh, by hand with that Vaseline, and we create our own Vaseline gauze very inexpensively. Next slide. Uh, here's a weck knife on the left that's being used to debride a wound. The guards are calibrated so that you can't cut too deep, uh, and you just kind of keep cutting a layer by layer by layer until you get good uh, healthy tissue and have removed all of the full thickness burn. Uh, the picture on the right, again, is an arm that was uh, burned extensively. And so we had to debride uh, all of that right down to the muscle and then skin graft on top of that. Next slide. If you have a, a, a dermatome like on the left, uh, that makes life very uh, easy. These are typically either electrical powered or gas powered. Uh, and so if you have one, it's very useful. Uh, on the right is a skin mesher uh, where you can uh, go ahead and run a piece of skin through uh, the machine and it will cut all those uh, holes and turn it into a mesh that can be expanded. Uh, one of the things that, that I do encourage uh, anyone who is used to doing burns to do is help help teach the national staff uh, so that they can go ahead and continue after you come home uh, from a short-term visit uh, and they can continue to treat the burn victims rather than having to wait uh, until the next volunteer comes along. Next slide. Uh, here's an example of a foot wound that has been debrided uh, and uh, it's got a, a good uh, granulation bed that is ready for skin grafting. And so the picture on the right uh, is a sheet graft uh, that has not been meshed. Uh, that, and sheet grafts are what we would put across hands or any surface that has a joint, uh, certainly over ankles, elbows, knees, we would want to put, go ahead and put a sheet graft. You can't quite make it out in that sheet graft, but there are some tiny little holes cut with a scalpel that, that are there just to allow fluid to escape uh, out from underneath the graft that otherwise might prevent it from adhering properly. And you just suture that in place or, or staple it in place for several days until the skin graft uh, basically bonds onto the underlying tissue uh, and uh, gets a blood supply from that tissue. Next slide. The dressings that you put on a skin graft are essential. Uh, if you don't do a, a good job at putting those uh, dressings on, the graft is going to fail, that skin will be lost, and, and you're going to have to regraft. So on top of your skin graft, you want to put a Vaseline gauze uh, and then some very bulky gauze dressings to apply pressure uh, to the gauze, uh, the, the Vaseline gauze, and then to the skin to hold it in place. Uh, splint uh, extremities so that they will not move because otherwise your skin grafts will shear or move. Uh, splint them for at least three days. Remove the dressings uh, after uh, two to three days to make sure that the skin graft's healing and then you can begin some simple range of motion exercises. We would continue to put Vaseline gauze on that skin graft for probably the first two weeks. Uh, and then after that, switch to a moisturizer. Uh, you can use Vaseline, you can use cocoa butter, uh, you can use uh, whatever is locally available to keep the skin moist uh, and uh, protect the skin graft. Next slide. So the picture on the left is an example of one of those little three by four inch uh, pieces of Vaseline gauze. Uh, doesn't go very far and uh, you'll find that most hospitals only have uh, maybe a box or two of that. So we create our own. Uh, on top of that, we would put uh, several layers of gauze and then a, a bulky dressing. Here we've used Webrill that uh, we got from the orthopedic ward uh, and then put a splint on top of that to be able to prevent uh, the skin graft from moving since it extends over an elbow. Next slide. A negative pressure wound therapy or what uh, many people here in the States call VAC therapy can be extremely helpful for burn injuries. Uh, the, the picture on the left was a patient who stepped into an open fire and has a full thickness burn of their ankle. Um, that burn extended down into the tendons of the foot uh, and that, that middle picture, you can't quite make it out, but uh, the very center of the dorsum of the foot has some thrombosed uh, blood vessels. Uh, but we were a little reluctant to keep debriding the first time because we were afraid we would get down into the tendons. So for something like this, do an initial debridement, 
uh, go ahead and put a negative pressure wound therapy dressing on it, wait a couple days, bring them back to theater, take it off, uh, debride a little bit more of the, of the dead tissue, and eventually uh, you'll get to a healthy uh, wound bed that you can go ahead and put a skin graft on. Next slide. Here's an example of a healing skin graft. This is about 10 days out. Uh, it's uh, time to get this, uh, the staples out. You can see that this was a meshed graft uh, and the patient's own tissue has grown up through the open areas of that graft. Uh, the wound is uh, now kind of dry. It's got kind of this dull sheen to it, which tells us that all of the epithelium has grown back. And so this would be a, a wound that would be perfect to just begin uh, having a moisturizer put on it several times a day. And you would do that for the first couple of months after it's been grafted. Next slide. This is an algorithm, and I realize it's a uh, small print, but this is an algorithm that we put together at uh, Tenwick several years ago when we were asked to come in and help them set up a, a, a burn ward. Uh, and it kind of just uh, lays out everything that we've just talked about. Uh, going through uh, the ABCs of, of getting the patient resuscitated early on, how to do your initial burn wound to breed month, uh, and then making the decision, is this a full thickness burn that I'm going to have to graft? Is this a partial thickness burn uh, that should be able to heal on its own? And then how to do uh, the dressing changes. The vast majority of the burns that you're going to encounter uh, are going to be very easily managed just with local wound care or with small skin grafts. So again, burn injuries are not something to be afraid of. Uh, the earlier you can go ahead and treat these, the better the long-term outcome is going to be for the patient. So I'm going to stop there and I will be happy to answer whatever questions there may be. All right, uh, Mike uh, or Dr. Cheatham, thank you so much. That was uh, a great uh, presentation and overview of burn management um, in resource limited settings. Um, I am going to wait for a few minutes. I don't see any initial questions yet. Um, but uh, a couple things I'll just comment on there, Mike, is um, one, I think uh, just uh, what you mentioned is uh, burns are, we shouldn't be intimidated uh, by burns. They're, they're certainly daunting and, 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 and very, very sad because of their prevalence. Um, but uh, with the you know, ABCs uh, of management that you just reviewed, uh, they're really, they, we shouldn't be intimidated um, that uh, we uh, certainly can manage them. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's uh, so many uh, um, cases of, of uh, burns in the developing world, as you pointed out in the beginning. So this is a very, very applicable um, of management. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention too, uh, Mike, is I certainly agree with you is, uh, you know, it's uh, so important that when we go out uh, that we, uh, you know, work with our colleagues, our national colleagues, and uh, this is uh, obviously something that they're going to be confronting much more uh, frequently than ourselves. So um, it behooves us to uh, share what we know with them, and, uh, and I know we can learn from them as well, um, but uh, this is... Uh, you know, um, uh, something that they certainly want to be very adroit at and capable uh, of doing so. Um, so I'm just encouraging our listening audience uh, to ask questions. You've got uh, Dr. Cheatham's undivided attention. But Mike, our first question is, is from uh, someone I know well, Kelly Seitz. <laughs> and uh, she is deployed just a couple of times with us. Uh, she says, how do you care for an escherotomy? Uh, clean daily and keep moist. Uh, we used honey on badly burned patients in Iraq after mortar attacks, and it worked well. Well, first off, it's it's great to hear from Kelly. Kelly, I'm, I wish I could talk to you directly, but I hope uh, hope you're doing well. Um, so you're right. You know, I was going to bring up that uh, this is something that the DART teams uh, will certainly see uh, in, in disaster regions. Uh, honey works great. It is uh, an age-old remedy uh, for burns, uh, dates way back into Egyptian times. Uh, and with regard to escherotomies, you're absolutely correct. Keep the wound moist. You don't want the tissues to dry out uh, because if they, if they dry out, uh, then those tissues will die uh, as well. So just keeping, uh, keeping them clean with uh, whatever uh, ointment or honey you, you're using and gauze changed on a daily basis would be great. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, it's funny. Um, even uh, on the uh, domestic side, uh, I'm seeing uh, a number of doctors utilize uh, honey uh, in this uh, situation. So, um, uh, yeah, it works. Um, so uh, that, that's very interesting. Um, it's a great sterile medium. But uh, uh, Dr. Alan Sawyer, uh, someone else we know well, and we appreciate uh, all his service. He says, Dr. Cheatham, is early mobility and range of motion exercises more important than daily, daily wound changes? Well, uh, greetings to Alan as, as well. I wish I was there with you right now. Say hi to everybody for me. Um, you know, it's, it, I would say there's probably not one or the other that's more important. They're, they're equally important. Um, if I had the, the option of early mobility versus uh, doing multiple uh, burn wound changes a day, I, I'd probably go for the early mobility and maybe just doing one uh, dressing change a day as opposed to multiple, um, you know, if it's a question of manpower and resources in the hospital, but they're both equally important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a internist, uh, but uh, also a physical therapist by training. And so I'll throw in there that, uh, you know, range of mo early range of motion is just critical. Um, because we've all seen um, unfortunate patients that did not get adequate range of motion and, and rehab and uh, they're severely contracted, um, which you can also, you know, surgically rectify later, but certainly the outcome is not nearly as um, effective as just a very uh, aggressive uh, PT. And, and it's hard. Range of motion is very painful, um, but it's an essential uh, piece uh, of the care. Um, Mike, uh, uh, are uh, a couple of uh, the Thesans are out on the field with us uh, in the post-residency program. And uh, they say, do you have any special considerations when treating high percentage burns in severely malnourished patients? Do you worry about refeeding syndrome? Great questions. Um, so we, uh, we start nutrition off on our burn patients literally within a couple of hours of arrival. Uh, the longer you wait, the more behind uh, the game you're gonna be. So uh, we get uh, feeding tubes in these patients, uh, nasoenteric tubes, if they're not able to take things orally, and as I mentioned earlier, they typically aren't able to take in as much calorie and protein as they need to orally, so we supplement them. Uh, do we worry about refeeding syndrome? Absolutely. Uh, it is definitely something to watch out for. Uh, you'll get a pretty good sense if they start having a lot of diarrhea uh, that, uh, that they're getting into trouble with refeeding, and you'll probably want to back off uh, on the feeding. Uh, you don't have the ability to measure electrolytes uh, as readily uh, out on the field as you would here in the States, but it's certainly something to, to be concerned about. Nutrition is key. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, um, uh, Julie and Jesh. Um, let's see, back to Dr. Sawyer. Um, he says, uh, silver uh, uh, sulfidine, or sulfidine uh, still seems to be plentiful in some pharmacies in developing world hospitals. Is uh, sylvadine still okay uh, to use on burns? Sure, absolutely. Um, it, it, we still see it getting used a lot here in the States. Uh, I had a patient that was transferred yesterday uh, in from an outside hospital that had been placed in sylvadine. Have no problem with that. We have switched from sylvadine to uh, bacitracin uh, to uh, a triple antibiotic uh, ointment, uh, but uh, there's no problem with sylvadine. You can still use it. We're still waiting to see uh, long-term what the literature is gonna show. Uh, but uh, in this situation, use whatever you have available. Right. Um, so Mike, this is more of a domestically related question as opposed to international, um, but I guess in some, uh, some settings it could be applied to. Uh, any problems with uh, MRSA, um, like uh, when with utilization, you know, since we're, it's basically, you know, like bacitracin and, and um, those uh, triple antibiotics are maybe not directed against MRSA. Are you seeing any problems with that at all evolving? We aren't. Uh, interestingly, uh, honey uh, apparently has great uh, activity against MRSA. Oh, wow. Uh, so maybe we all ought to be just switching to honey. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely some... The, because you're washing these wounds on a daily basis, and we like to use a good antibacterial soap to do that, um, you can usually keep the colony counts down pretty well. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. Well, 
God knew what he was doing when he created bees and honey. Uh, okay. Um, any other questions? Um, we're about to um, close up, uh, but uh, if there's any, uh, I've got time for maybe one more question before um, we adjourn. I don't see any. Um, so just uh, while we're waiting here, um, Mike, again, that was an incredible presentation. I've been trying for a number of years to get you uh, on, and I'm delighted that you have joined us. Um, and uh, now I appreciate, I know you're an incredibly busy man. And so just taking the time, we just want to corporately thank you so much uh, for being on today. I wanted to remind our listening audience um, that CME credit uh, is available uh, for this session. The form and instructions um, are available via your email. And we will also be, uh, of course, in the next day or so, we'll be um, uh, uh, sending out the uh, recording for you to enjoy. And just again, I just want to encourage everybody, you know, we've accumulated a, a really robust archives now. If you just go to um, uh, health, I'll find it just a second. I don't have it memorized. Uh, health.samaritanspurse.org. There's an incredibly robust website. I really encourage you to utilize that um, uh, to uh, look at various topics uh, that are relevant, especially before you deploy to, a, uh, uh, you know, with the DART team or you deploy to one of our World Med hospitals. Um, we're developing that for your use um, and um, encourage uh, that utilization. Um, also, just want to remind everybody, uh, normally um, our next, our subsequent webinar is the second Wednesday of every month, um, but we're making one up. So we uh, have another one scheduled for Wednesday, April the uh, 25th, another familiar um, face uh, in the, uh, both in the World Med and DART world is uh, Tim Mosher, um, a family nurse practitioner who will be presenting uh, triage and patient flow management in the emergency field hospital. So I really encourage you um, uh, to, uh, to uh, join um, Tim Mosher and myself uh, when we present that on April the 25th, you'll see an email uh, notification for that. We're going to wrap up with one last question uh, from, uh, well, I've got two here. I'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, Peter Kwan. Hello, Peter. He says, um, what about use of honey, uh, I guess, coupled with betadine? So honey works very well, as we've uh, spoken about. Betadine, uh, there's good evidence to show that betadine actually interferes with uh, macrophages. Right. Uh, and it would also tend to dry uh, wounds out. Uh, many mm -hmm. surgeons will put betadine on a wound to try and dry it. We want to keep these burn wounds moist. Uh, so I, I don't have any experience with with mixing honey and betadine, but would probably uh, would probably recommend it against it uh, mm -hmm. for the reasons outlined. Uh, and then the last question here: How many times a day would you recommend dressing changes? Um, so typically. Uh, before grafting, it depends on what we use, uh, but we will do at least one dressing change a day, sometimes two, uh, if the collagen uh, or the wound is particularly dirty. Uh, so if you can get by with doing just one dressing change a day, that's fine. And then after the skin uh, grafting, uh, we change the dressings once a day. Right. Okay. Well, uh, Mike, I think that wraps it up uh, for us here today um, at Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Uh, again, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. I do hope you all will join us on April 25th. Have a great day. God bless.